The world is beginning to split apart into East and West Poles with opposite plans for world order. China and Russia are becoming allies without limit. And Russia's war in Ukraine may be leaning toward a Ukraine victory, even as Ukraine plans a massive counteroffensive. Russia threatens nuclear escalation and provokes U.S.-controlled airspace in Syria. And several human infectious diseases are cropping up at rapid levels, and the economy keeps taking blows. There's much to unpack in this news segment. Plus, I'll announce the winner of our last video's giveaway and tell you how you can win a new great giveaway. So let's dive in. China. President Xi Jinping gave a strong show of support for Putin and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right now, there are changes, the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years, and we are the ones driving those changes together, Xi told Putin as he stood at the door of the Kremlin to bid him farewell. So what did Xi mean by not seen in 100 years? In his country, the Communist Party of China had not yet come to be. Russia had just formed the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, but the country was far from a superpower. A few years previously, World War I had just ended, and the League of Nations was founded through the work of President Woodrow Wilson. Now, after World War II, the United Nations succeeded the League of Nations. It's the assertion of power in an attempt to unify and bring peace and stability that these two leaders are really against. They hope to create a multipolar world where there is the West and the East. In both countries, and many of the countries they are aligning together in BRICS, don't want to have to answer to the rest of the world for anything from human rights violations to heavy-handed oppressing their own people to violating the sovereign borders of other countries they claim, Ukraine and Taiwan specifically. Now, China is starting to act like a superpower as well. Long reluctant to inject itself into the conflicts far from its own shores, Beijing is showing a new assertiveness. China recently brokered a peace deal between the turbulent Middle East rivals and OPEC partners Iran and Saudi Arabia. Earlier this month, China released a 12-point peace plan that would have handed Ukrainian land to Russia and established itself as a prominent receiver of Ukraine's rebuilding and reconstruction projects. Now, China's work deals around the world with a host of countries who oppose what is perceived to be Western hegemony. China signed a 540 million energy deal with the Taliban. China has eked lithium deals in the Lithium Triangle of South America, home to over 50% of the world's mineral supply comprising Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. If money is to be made and resources to be gained, and the country disdains U.S. influence, you can bet China and Russia are trying to form a partnership. It doesn't matter if that country is communist, democratically run, or a monarchy, or a dictatorship. It doesn't matter if that country is attacking its neighbors or committing genocide against its own people. That's a frightening new world order to emerge in this multipolar world that these two leaders are trying to form. Russia declared last year that it was building a new democratic world order with China, though I'm not sure democratic is the correct term here. The alliance between these two countries is clearly aligned in opposition to the United States, and they're attempting to bring in any country that the West has influence. That includes countries that have been forced to hold free and fair elections. That includes any country that has been sanctioned for any reason. And so far, Xi has not publicly promised Russian weapons, but as we reported in an earlier video, many weapons have been sent to Russia. It would be naive to think that these are not going to end up on the battlefield. We know that Chinese companies have supplied drone parts to Russia that have shown up on the battlefield. So there is what we see and what they profess. Still, the world would be naive to believe that these two countries aren't making secret deals to provide armaments to Russia and mutually support each other in their territorial aspirations. Now, in China's written and released statement after the meeting, China's government said that Xi and Putin shared the view that their two countries' relationship has gone far beyond the bilateral scope and acquired critical importance for the global landscape and the future of humanity. What do you think? Are we seeing the rise of a new world order? In multipolar world where people are governed either through some democratic process or by autocrats? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. In the meantime, we're going to keep a close eye on anything made in China and showing up on the battlefield in Ukraine. And the reasons to prepare as if we're about to enter another world war, I think are becoming clear by the day. One positive piece of news with China is that Chinese defense officials met their Australian counterparts on Wednesday. So at least there is still a dialogue between these two emerging polarities. China has concerns about the alliance unveiled last week to provide Australia with nuclear power attack submarines. And it's important to note that these are nuclear powered and not armed with nuclear weapons. Britain would take delivery of the first submarine in the late 2030s 
and Australia would receive its first in the early 2040s. BAE Systems and Rolls-Royce will build the vessels. A future battle for naval superiority is emerging over the next two decades. We're going to keep an eye on that as well. Russia. Russia accused Britain of planning to send Ukraine weapons with a nuclear component, which is a misleading description of depleted uranium tank shells valued for the dense metal's armor-piercing ability. Now, Russian Ambassador Anatoly Antonov, who we heard last week denying that Russia tried to down a U.S. surveillance drone, he stated this, It seems that the enlightened West, led by Washington, has irrevocably decided to bring humanity to a dangerous line beyond which a nuclear Armageddon is looming ever more distinctly. The real concern for Russia here is the effectiveness of this tank-busting weapon. White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said this, This is a commonplace type of munition that is used especially for its armor-piercing capabilities. So again, if Russia is particularly concerned about the welfare of their tanks and their tank soldiers, they could just take him across the border back into Russia. As positive of a move to create peace as that might be, Russia is not likely to end the war in Ukraine anytime soon. NATO's Secretary General said this week that Russia is planning a long, drawn-out war of attrition and that President Putin doesn't plan for peace, he's planning for more war. It is estimated that Ukraine is firing about 4,000 to 7,000 artillery rounds daily and Russia is firing close to 20,000 rounds per day. This rate of fire is outstripping Western manufacturing at the moment and it is well established that Russia is being supplied with artillery rounds from North Korea. This war has definitely taken a toll on Ukraine as well. A World Bank report has estimated it will cost Ukraine over $411 billion over the next 10 years to recover and rebuild from Russia's war on the country. This number will continue to rise by the day as the war approaches its 400th day next week. And the report details some of the economic and human tolls of Russia's war, including nearly 2 million homes, more than one in five public health institutions damaged, 650 ambulances damaged or stolen, and at least over 9,000 civilians confirmed dead. Now, NATO released an annual report this Tuesday that acknowledged only seven of the 30 member states met their current defense spending target of 2% GDP in 2022. Now, this doesn't account for other contributions to the Ukrainian defense effort. Still, it does reveal how one side of Russia, China, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and North Korea, they've all been ramping up for war, and they've adopted a posture for war, while the Western forces are trying to wage a defensive war with leftovers and overstocks. Eventually, the West is going to have to ramp up their defense spending and align their industrial output to support the war more directly. This is inevitable once forces come into direct conflict with each other. And we still don't know for sure, but the tide of the war in Bakhmut may be changing. Ukraine says Russia's Bakhmut assault has lost steam, according to Kiev. Now, Ukrainian forces are expected to soon launch a counteroffensive, as they did when they took back Kiev and Kharkiv. A journalist near the front lines in Bakhmut confirmed the report that Russian forces in the area might be flagging. It's equally probable that they are switching to a defensive posture in anticipation of Ukraine's counter-assault. Whatever is true here, the Wagner Forces leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, wrote a letter to the Russian defense minister demanding he acts to prevent the Ukrainian army from cutting off the Wagner's forces. There does appear to be cracks emerging in the Russian forces, so we're going to continue to watch this closely to see if this is a possible turning point in the war. Now, this is not going to make the Kremlin happy, obviously. It also won't make the Kremlin happy that Sweden's parliament voted Wednesday in favor of joining NATO despite Hungary and Turkey's delays in ratifying its membership's bid, which will likely lead to Sweden joining after neighboring Finland. Now, Turkey and Hungary are the only NATO countries yet to ratify the Nordic countries' bids, requiring unanimous ratification by all 30 members. Now, it is interesting to note that Sweden and Finland, they dropped their decades-long policies of military non-alignment and applied to join the Transatlantic Defense Pact last May in the wake of Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Though Finland, too, has yet to be ratified, the country has made a historic move by opening its airspace for NATO surveillance and intelligence missions, allowing the alliance to monitor Russian activities more closely in the region. And by opening its airspace for NATO surveillance and intelligence missions, Finland hopes to enhance its situational awareness and deterrence posture in the Baltic Sea region. There's yet to be a Russian response to this move, but it will force Russia to respond somehow, as Finland and Russia share over a 1,300-kilometer border, and St. Petersburg is connected to the Baltic Sea. 
Perhaps an early response can be seen in Syria, where armed Russian jets have flown over a U.S. military garrison in Syria nearly every day in March, violating a 40-year-old agreement between the United States and Russia and risking escalation. The war continues with alliances being strengthened between the two sides. One telling sign will be Putin's trip to South Africa in August. Because of the criminal charges levied against Putin by the International Criminal Court, South Africa is obligated to arrest Putin when he sets foot in the country for the scheduled BRICS summit. Now, South Africa is not committed to arresting Putin. It will be forced to choose to either quit its support of the ICC established by the West and align itself with Russia or carry through with the forceful detainment of Putin. South Africa has unsighted with the African Union and has flip-flopped in its support of the ICC many times in the past. So they're not likely to act in favor of the court now since they didn't win Syria's Bashir visited years ago. There is also the possibility that this BRICS meeting is going to be moved or postponed if Putin simply will not attend. What do you think? Is there any possible resolution to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, or are we marching into an even larger global war? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below and what you're doing to prepare for this potential conflict. Economy. The Federal Reserve is really caught between a rock and a hard place. One is inflation, and the other is the damage to the economy done by raising rates. When they emerged from their meeting, they had decided to raise interest rates by just a quarter percentage point. As we suggested in an earlier video, they also indicated that they were on the verge of pausing further increases in borrowing costs after the recent collapse of two U.S. banks. Now, the much anticipated rate hike by the Fed, which had delivered eight previous rate hikes in the past year, sought to balance the risk of rampant inflation with the threat of instability in the banking system. So we can probably assume that we are all in a wait and see holding pattern with the economy. Banks will probably adjust their balance sheets and the credit will be tighter and the economy will slow down. Global inflation may have peaked. Leading economists don't even know as they urge a give it time and wait and see approach. The federal chair, Jerome Powell, he cautioned by saying, the process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go and is likely to be bumpy. And it's a little unclear what other tools the Fed has. The government as a whole can use fiscal policy to fix inflation by increasing taxes or by cutting spending. Increasing taxes leads to decreased individual demand and a reduction in the supply of money in the economy. And this economic crisis isn't gonna go away anytime soon. And the longer it lingers, the more likely that it will be worse. Expect to hear much more about it as Congress begins arguing about raising the debt limit and threats of a government shutdown will probably fill the headlines. On Thursday, the Bank of England, they followed the Federal Reserve and the Swiss National Bank in pressing on with interest rate hikes, arguing that the UK banking sector was strong enough to withstand the instability that rippled through markets this month. Governments and banking CEOs are rushing forward to assure people that the banking system is sound. Diseases. All right, enough about war and possible economic collapse. It's important that you understand that there are two diseases that you will be hearing much more about in the coming days and weeks. First is the avian flu, which we covered in other videos on this channel. It hasn't gone away and the cases they do continue to rise. Farms in southeastern Mexico have recently culled 1.7 million birds out of their flock. And since the start of this recent outbreak, they have slaughtered close to 3 million birds as they strive to stay ahead of the outbreak. Now, most of the 3 million birds come from egg production facilities, and the risk of catching avian flu from eating infected poultry or eggs is still rare, but it's possible if these foods are undercooked and the locals are eating the meat and eggs of these infected chickens. This is one of the ways these zoonotic infections can leap to humans, so definitely pay attention about the possibility of a future avian flu outbreak. The only upside to this is that avian flu is a type of influenza virus, so our bodies do have a history of fighting it. We have developed some immunity components to reduce the infection rate and fight it off. Still, as viruses mutate from one host to another, they can become more virulent, prep accordingly, and act as if we will likely see a rise of infection rates in the coming weeks and months. Now, if it's not viruses, it's a new fungus capturing the headlines. Well, it's not exactly a new fungus exactly, but it is currently breaking out and spreading at an alarming rate. Now, before you panic, make sure you know the facts about this fungus, Candidaris. It's resistant to common antifungal drugs and is primarily breaking out in long-term care and healthcare facilities. Put this outbreak currently in the category with MRSA. MRSA is a cause of staph infection that is difficult to treat because of resistance to some antibiotics. 
If you or someone you know is immunocompromised in a long-term care facility or undergoing surgery anytime soon, they are at a higher risk of becoming infected with the drug-resistant Candidaris. Assuming you don't fit into one of these groups, you probably will be able to mark yourself safe from this. Now, these viral and fungal outbreaks are going to become more common as we see recorded global temperatures rise, we come into more contact with more and more animals of the wild, and extreme weather forces us in closer contact with each other. Make sure fighting and preventing infections of any kind are part of your preps. What do you think? Are we going to see another global outbreak of one of these? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Giveaway. For this week's giveaway, we're going to be giving away a water drop gravity water filter straw. To be eligible for a chance to win in this giveaway, just simply post a comment below and click the like button. And next week, I'll use a tool to draw a winner from the comments of this video randomly. I'm not going to reach out to you unless your name appears on the screen next week, and you must have your email address listed on the About tab of your YouTube profile. Now, I would encourage you, please ignore and report any comments telling you that you've won or to contact me through WhatsApp or Telegram because it is not me. For the last video's giveaway of the Premium KitGo Emergency Car Kit, the winner is a subscriber, JN Large. I'll reach out to you shortly to get that sent to you. Storms. Finally, on the subject of extreme weather, California in the West continues to get slammed by the atmospheric river after atmospheric river. In the city of Montebello in Los Angeles County, a powerful tornado even touched down. And the atmospheric river is bringing rain, and these extreme weather events aren't looking to end until about mid-April. While the rainfall and snowpack are great news for this year's farming, as California produces so much of what we and the rest of the country eat, it hasn't sufficiently raised water levels in Lake Mead or other places where hydroelectric energy is generated. As reservoirs are filling to high levels, the snowpack level has not been seen in ages, and drought conditions are moving from severe to moderate and even light. Now, the more significant problem and the big question for the Western United States is how much of this water is going to end up going deep down into the Earth's aquifers. For that to happen, the West will need several more years of rainfall like they are seeing this year. And beyond the potential for better harvest, it is essential to understand that this weather travels from west to east across the United States. And that means heavy rain, thunderstorms, and even tornadoes are possible in a belt across the country. Now, even as we prepare for hypotheticals like world wars or outbreaks of diseases, don't forget the most important thing that you should be preparing against, which is natural disasters. If your area has had tornadoes in the past, ask yourself how prepared you are for them in the future. And if you live in the Ohio River Valley and your area experienced flooding in years past, realize that this could happen again. Prepping against that event should be your first priority. And as such, your most important preps are food and water. Don't get caught up prepping for events that might happen when you should be preparing for events that will occur. Before we end this video, let me just end on a personal note. I just did a video a few days ago where I explain the need for mental health in this community. I bring that up at this point in the video because again, every time I do these videos, they're heavy. There's a lot going on. There's a lot that can be problematic is the way I always put it. I hate to use the word that scares me or that phrase because I'm not scared. I realize that we're living in a time of uncertainty, but fear is not part of the equation because being prepared, it puts me in a position where I'm at least ready for whatever may come. Well, to a point, I don't think we'll fully ever be ready for everything, but to the best of my ability, I'll put it that way. Having said that, guard your mental health. A lot is happening right now. There's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of things are moving quick, especially with this issue with China and Russia that's developing. So I would encourage you to go back and watch the video. I just released it before this video, so you can go check it out. It's about 12 minutes long, and I just share kind of a heartfelt message. Uh, my concern for you, the community, I would encourage you to check that out. If you have any questions or any thoughts, feel free to post those below. And as always, stay safe out there.